In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Serpas were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. One called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole, the whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voice and of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am, a, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When one of the serpents flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs, the serpent touched my mouth, and with it said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is bottled out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaimed to you, which you in turn received, in which you also stand, through which you also are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you, as of first importance, what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and, in, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. So both the lessons this morning are about being called and having a purpose. And we're going to start with the, the New Testament lesson from 1 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians is a letter the Apostle Paul writes to the first church in Corinth when that church is having a hard time getting along with each other. They had, uh, there are lots of different groups of people in the church, and when you put a bunch of different people together from different backgrounds all together, you sometimes end up with conflict because not everyone's starting on the same page. In Corinth, you've got rich people looking down on poor people. Those with particular spiritual gifts are looking down on others without those gifts. And people of higher status are excluding lower status people from having communion with them. Now, we might not have those exact sorts of, same sorts of conflicts as the Corinthians, but friction about who gets to be in charge or how things is, are done, that's pretty much a feature of most human organizations, from churches, schools, workplaces, volunteer organizations, and so on. I'm sure many of us have had times where we've seen or experienced conflict because different people have different expectations or we're coming from totally different places. So the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians to help them sort out these conflicts and give them advice about how to live together as a community. And this letter has a, a back-to-basics quality to it because Paul decides the best way to address what's going on in Corinth is to remind people of the fundamental things that brought them all together in the first place. So Paul spends a lot of time talking about love and Jesus. Now, he talks about love because love is what knits a community together and informs how we should treat one another. That passage that's often read at weddings about love being patient, love being kind, that's from this letter. And it's where Paul is telling church members how to treat one another. And he's also noting that loving actual real life people takes work. Love isn't just a feeling, it's an action and an attitude. And one of the things Paul says in that section is that love is one of the gifts of the Spirit, the greatest gift of the Spirit. So love is a gift of God. Now after Paul finishes talking about love, he moves to talking about Christ's resurrection, which is at the heart of the Christian faith and demonstrates to the Corinthians and us what sort of God we have. 
So talking about the resurrection is where the lesson from 1 Corinthians picks up, and Paul will go on in the rest of the chapter to explain the importance of the resurrection and some of its implications. But in this opening part, Paul focuses on the most concrete reasons why the Corinthians should believe in the resurrection. And the strongest evidence he has is that eyewitnesses have testified to seeing the risen Christ. And in ancient times like today, eyewitness testimony is valued very highly. And Paul lists a lot of people who swear they've seen Jesus risen from the grave. But the part I find most interesting is where Paul testifies about what he's experienced with seeing the risen Christ and tells a tiny bit of his story of being called by God. Before Paul dedicates his life to spreading the gospel, he was a Pharisee who made it his mission to stamp out the worship of Jesus. He was a, Paul was a very zealous man, and he thought he was doing what God would want him to do. So he efficiently and enthusiastically per, persecuted the early church, which uh, caused a lot of people to die and led to the first Christian martyrs. But one day, as Paul was going along the road to Damascus, he's knocked off his feet and temporarily blinded by an appearance of the risen Christ. And Jesus asks Paul, why do you persecute me? And Jesus goes on to commission Paul to do a complete 180 and go from persecuting the church to instead preaching the gospel to Gentiles, to non-Jewish people. Now, as you can imagine, the people of the early church had a bit of a hard time accepting Paul's change of heart at first. This guy had gotten their friends murdered, and suddenly he wanted to join them. To think of a present-day example, imagine you're a Giants fan, and Tom Brady, in his retirement years, suddenly starts telling everyone his true purpose in life is actually to be an ardent Giants fan and support the Giants in absolutely everything they do. That's kind of how the early church would have viewed Paul at first. But people began to accept Paul once they saw his actions, passion, and sincerity. On that road to Damascus, Paul's life and purpose were completely turned upside down. But he embraces his new purpose with perhaps even more zeal than he had when he was persecuting the church. From this section of Paul's letter, we get a sense of his overwhelming feeling of gratefulness for God working in his life even when Paul has done some really awful things. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. In addition to Paul saying he's seen the risen Christ, Paul is testifying to the truth of the resurrection because he's experienced a resurrection in his own life. God has turned Paul's life around and plucked him out of wrongdoing and given him a purpose. If God can work that sort of resurrection in Paul's own life, there's no telling what's possible with God. When I was in seminary, we had chapel every day, and chapel was followed by coffee hour. And I remember one coffee hour, I was talking with my classmates, and we were discussing the scripture lesson for the day, which was about Moses. And I remember one of my classmates sagely taking a bite of his munchkin and saying, I take great comfort that Moses was a murderer. And so we all turned and looked at him, and he then had to continue through chewing his munchkin. Well, if Moses was a murderer, that certainly means there's hope for me. I haven't killed anyone, and Moses murdered a guy. But God had him be the one who, to lead the Israelites out of slavery. There's the same sort of hope in Paul's story that my classmate saw in Moses' story. The Lord is a God of second chances. The grace and forgiveness of God are such good news because all of us fall short of our best at times. We mess up, hurt other people. That God is a God of second chances means there's always hope for us. Now we can sometimes face a lot of pressure to do things right, meet lots of different expectations put on us about what we look like, what we do with our lives, how good we are at things, how successful we are. And I know I sometimes struggle with wanting to do things perfectly and feeling like a complete failure if I make a mistake. There have been times where I felt like if I messed this one thing up, I'd completely ruined my life and there was no turning back. 
kind of the, the three events that particularly stand out in my life where I felt like a complete failure after falling short of expectations that I'd set for myself are uh, I didn't make the school softball team after getting, uh, going to callbacks. Um, I got a lower score on the LSAT the first time I took it than I got on my practice test. And the first time I didn't get a job I really wanted. Those events were just crushing. And maybe some of you have had times where making a mistake or falling short of expectations just hurt extra and caused a lot of self-doubt. Now even though Paul's got a direct commission from God about what he's supposed to do after Jesus appears to him, Paul still runs into trouble and things don't go as planned. Sometimes we can get into the trap of thinking that doing the right thing or what we're supposed to do will always be easy. When we run into difficult times, it can make us question whether we're going the right way or cut out for something. But often God calls us to do things that are challenging. When Paul goes to one town to evangelize, things go very poorly. The people respond with such hostility that they try to murder Paul, and his friends have to help him escape the city through lowering him off the city wall in a basket in the dead of night. So that's not what we would call a successful mission trip. In the Old Testament lesson, the prophet Isaiah is called by God to preach God's word in the world. But if we kept reading on in the lesson, we'd find out that Isaiah is called to preach to people who aren't going to listen. God calls Isaiah to share news, and none of the people Isaiah is are, none of the people that Isaiah is sent to are going to pay any attention to him. His words and warnings are going to fall on deaf ears. Sometimes doing the right thing doesn't lead to recognition or measurable success. God calls each and every one of us to love our neighbors as ourselves, and that's one of the hardest things to do. And we can love our neighbors through the kindness we show to people we know and the kindness we show to strangers. We can love our neighbors through helping, welcoming, and advocating for people who are on the margins of society, people who don't have enough, who are unhoused, excluded, stigmatized, and ostracized. We can love our neighbors through serving others and giving out of thanksgiving for what we've received. But loving actual real live people is hard work because real live people are imperfect and sometimes have unlovable qualities. And we all fall short at times of what we're called to do and who we're called to be. But it's through acts of love, kindness, and service that God works through us to make this kingdom on earth ever closer to God's kingdom in heaven. The experiences of Paul, Isaiah, and Moses are kind of a helpful corrective for the sort of toxic thinking that makes us think that, <laughs> that makes us think if things aren't successful at first or if that if we mess up that we're worthless. And I'm gonna hazard a guess that Moses and Paul messed up bigger than any of us have. Moses killed one guy and Paul is responsible for many people being killed. But God doesn't give up on them. God found them, turned them around, and gave them a purpose. And God doesn't give up on us when we mess up, fall short, or run into difficulty. In scripture, we can see the good news that our God is in the savior business, that none of us are beyond being turned around, that the world isn't too broken to be put right. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter how much money you have, no matter who you love, no matter where you're from, no matter what you look like, no matter what you've done, the salvation of God, the grace of God, the love of God, and the kingdom of God are for you. And by the grace of God, we are who we are. And we can trust that God's grace for us has not been in vain. Amen.